Welcome to the Books of the Book series. We're exploring the Gospel of Matthew. I'm Glenn Russell, Professor of Religion at Andrews University. I'm here with a good friend and Bible student, Ronko Stefanovic, Professor of New Testament at Andrews University Theological Seminary. Ronko, it's, it's a joy exploring God's Word together with you. Yes, Glenn, it's, it's, it's great joy to me to be with you. Glenn, you are a teacher, and I know you spend a lot of time with young people to prepare them for pastoral ministry there, there in the college, in the Department of Religion. Uh, do our young people really need education in order hmm. to be involved in ministry? Well, we need the right kind of education, you know. It's, uh, it's important to have zeal for the Lord. The, the first thing must be a commitment to Christ, desire to follow Him. But as I work with our students, I'm just so inspired working with young people who have a passion for Christ. They want to serve Him and they want to know more about His Word. They want to study Scripture deeply because they'll be the ones who will be sharing with the church members, sharing with the community. Yes, they, they need to have zeal, but they need to have knowledge that goes with it. And that's a powerful combination. Knowledge without a passion for Christ, knowledge without a heart surrendered to Jesus is dangerous. But a, a heart that is surrendered to Christ. And transformed by the Holy Spirit. And a mind that is transformed yeah. by the Holy Spirit. It's a powerful combination. Yeah. We live today in the world that we have so many different teachings that people in invented. We re really are dealing today with many complex issues that people are making with regard to the Bible. And the purpose of our education is to inform our young people about the current issues, etc., and to sit there at the feet of Jesus and to learn how really to study and to deal with the Bible so that our young people are equipped when they leave our institutions, educational institutions, they can preach the word powerfully, not for the purpose of arguing and providing arguments, right. I simply to make the gospel down to the earth to help people to feel the need for the gospel and for Jesus Christ. And you know what a joy it is when a student comes and prays with you or you pray with them yes. and, and to explore scripture together where we're both learning because yes. God is teaching us through his word. Let's continue doing that. and Let's invite God to, to bless our, our study together. Let's pray. Lord, we have, we have met you as our Lord and Savior. We've seen you come through the stories of, and, and the teachings of Scripture. We have seen Jesus, our, our Messiah, introduced at his baptism, tested in the temptations, teaching the people, healing the people. And now as he moves towards the cross, may our hearts and ears be especially attentive. Lord, may we be receptive to your spirit and to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Ronco, we're in chapter 22 of Matthew. These are the last days before the cross. We should be sure we remember the time period. So we have to keep in mind that with chapter 21, Jesus entered Jerusalem there. Yes. We saw that the first thing that Jesus did there in Jerusalem, he was greeted by people like a majesty. However, his appearance was not mm. of a majesty. It was a humble servant, Messiah, mm. riding a donkey, enter there. But then he enters there the temple, he cleansed the temple. And from this point on, there in Jerusalem, everything what we have, chapter 21, chapter 22, mm. and chapter 23, he's surrounded by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, challenging Jesus from moment to moment, keeping him so busy. By the way, this is the context of these chapters that we are going out of. So we're moving from the parade and all the praise to the cross. Yes. And now we see the intensifying conflict that you've mentioned. Yes. Let's go to Matthew chapter 22. We see Jesus, whatever Jesus is saying to the people are listening yes. as he's debating with the Pharisees, Jesus try to challenge them, mm -hmm. to bring them to repentance, to the realization what they were doing. Keep in mind, Jesus always tried to save a people. Yes. We read in the text, the Son of Man came to save. And time and is save. running out for his, his time running out. Yeah. Actually, and the time is running out for their repentance. That's right. That's right. So we see at the beginning of Matthew chapter 22, another parable. 
Yes. And it, let's remember what, what you said earlier, that every parable communicates some truth, but it also hides some things for people to explore and search their hearts about. And this he is has exactly, enemies. this is the one. That's right. Can you read it, Glenn? Why, why don't you read it? This All right, and again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, now we're going to verse two of chapter 22. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a marriage feast for his son. And when his servants uh, were sent to call those who were invited to the marriage feast, but they would not come. And again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, behold, I have made ready my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves are killed and everything is ready. Come to the marriage feast. But they made light of it and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry and he sent his troops, and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then they said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the thoroughfares and invite to the marriage feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth for many are called and few are chosen. Again, another statement that's familiar for us. Many are called but few are chosen, but now we understand it a little better in light of this parable. Actually, the entire point of this parable is verse 14. Many are called, mm -hmm. but few are chosen. So let's try to see a few details what this parable is all about. It's about what? What is the event here? It's the wedding. Mm -hmm. What is the wedding? When, according to the Jewish, ancient, ancient Jewish practice is, a young man would go to the gentleman's house. The wedding would take place. The wedding is, the, is a moment, an occasion, when you have the bridegroom and the bride, they join together. This, this so, is, so the, main, some, the, main, this is the main some point. There's getting ready that takes ready. place. But the main point is, who is the bride mm -hmm. that Jesus was talking about? Who are also, who are those guests? By the way, this is the same concept is found in the book of Revelation. Yeah. We see the church, the church is both the bride and the church is also the guests that are invited to wedding. So we have here um, two different imageries. Okay, so who are these people? It's evidently the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. They were waiting for the bridegroom for the Messiah to come. He came, he came, why? Marriage, to be united with his people because they were waiting for him. Actually, what happened? What happened? The call was made, the marriage is here, the wedding is here, the feast is ready. Did they care? No. What, what, what do we have? I mean, it, it's, it's tragic what because the invitation comes. And you know, in the East, many times time is a little less uh, exact. Yeah. So some of them thought, well, it's not quite time. It takes a long time to prepare the food. We'll do some other things. We'll procrastinate. But now they go beyond procrastination to rejection. And even more, some of them, they seized those servants. They mistreated them and even killed them. Do you see what the parable can do? This is exactly the history of the people of Israel, killing the prophets, you, you know, you know, all those you know, uh, things that they, they were doing, yes. the messengers, etc. Actually, Jesus told them a lot, but they couldn't accuse him because Jesus did not make a direct speech in, in, in addressing the situation there. But it seems that, and, and may I just pause for a moment, remind us, let's not try to take every detail of yeah. this and make it an allegory. Because Jesus is not saying that God is like a king who will slaughter yeah. people who don't accept his invitation. The main point is an invitation has come. The come, and, and also the, the, conse the consequences for the rejection. That's right. Jesus makes very, very clear, not only here, there is also another place that Jesus makes, there will be consequences. But then Jesus goes 
beyond that. You know, he's, what such, is that? he's such a masterful storyteller. Yeah. And I just want to say to you viewers, take time to read the scriptures and the stories. You'll be amazed at how he, uh, Jesus was able to draw our attention. And so many times you think the story could stop there, but it goes a little further. It's not just that he brings others in, the Gentiles, but now someone is in who shouldn't be. So what is then the next point? It's interesting that he comes and, and he notes that there's a guest there without a garment. So the wedding feast is ready, but what is the problem? There are no guests, there are no participants there. So uh, he instructs the servants what to do. Mm -hmm. Go to the streets, go to the corners, go to those homeless people, go, all kinds of people, go. Bring them all because I need the guests in my house. I need the guests there, there in the fees. Go to those who are unworthy because the worthy have not responded. And he says, and the wedding hall, verse 10, and the wedding hall was filled with the dinner guests. And I know if we have here at the end of the story, I say, you see, those who did not accept Jesus, they were rejected. Now the Gentiles were added, there. but this is not the point of the story. Unfortunately, people can read something that Jesus never intended because this is the real conclusion. What do we have in verses 18 and 12? You have a guest who's come, he's at the wedding, but he's not wearing the wedding garment. And? And, and Ronko, maybe just a word about the, the, the background. Why would that have been an offensive thing to be there without a wedding garment? Because evidently, uh, according to this story, um, everybody had to be in the same garment. Mm -hmm. You see, the problem is when you have, a, can you imagine, you have people who are originally invited. Some of them evidently came in the rich robes. But can you imagine when you bring all those homeless people, those people who live there on the street? I mean, the difference would be, would be obvious. But when you provide a garment to all guests, sometimes I saw some pilgrimage, etc. Everybody is dressed in the same dress then it makes everybody equal there. And it, nobody is there because of the prestige, because of special you know, you know, place in the society. Everybody is there equal at the wedding at the wedding. Feast. And that's a critical point because his garment is provided as a gift. Yes. But he likes his own better. Yeah. So what is the point of this story? You know, you know, we should not fall in the trap. You see, some people rejected. You see, other people came, they were accepted. No. No, all those who originally accepted and came and those who later were added, all of them were there, not because they deserve it, but because what the master prepared for them, it was that garment, that garment that made them equal, that made, uh, made them um, welcome there at the feast. The feast, an invitation to be there at the feast was really the gracious act of this, of this king, you know, of, this, of this master. What a great lesson to us. You know, when we go to rest uh, of, the, of, the, of the Bible, very often garment, especially the white robe, it's a symbol of Christ's righteousness and the things that God can do for human beings. You see, so many times we try to compare ourselves uh, with, with others or to compare people with another people, but all those who will one day find themselves in the kingdom of God. It's not because of our goodness, not because of who we are or because what we deserve. It's because what God has done to us. In the eyes of God, everybody is equal because what Jesus did for us. This is the beautiful yes. lesson given, given to us. What a glorious God we serve. And we're going to explore a little bit more about the compassion, the grace of God, and the response of the people in the Gospel of Matthew. When we come back after our break, we'll be right back. Please join us then. Hi, I'm Dr. Hans Dier. Today's world is full of contradictions. Popular magazines are full of beautiful, slender people, right along with full-page ads for fattening food. Supermarkets offer 25,000 slickly packaged, engineered taste sensations loaded with calories, right along with magazines offering the latest quickie diets. Take a look of how modern food technology and marketing have turned inexpensive, low-calorie foods into expensive caloric bombs. They've turned an apple of only 80 calories into a piece of apple pie with 480 calories. 
and they've turned an ear of corn of 200 calories into a package of nachos with 600 calories and a potato of 100 calories into a tube of Pringles with 1,000 calories. So here's my tip for today. Eat more foods as grown and you can eat more and weigh less and you have money left over for that new outfit. Welcome back. We're exploring Matthew chapter 22. We've just looked at the, the parable of the, of the marriage feast. Now, those parables had pointed messages and the Pharisees, Ronco, were not very receptive to them. <laughs> Let me read for you verse 15. What's the response? Then the Pharisees took counsel how to entangle him in his talk. So they set a trap for Jesus sure. and he's, they send their disciples to Jesus with a question. Oh, teacher, we know that you are true. Oh, what flattery. Beware when people come with flattery, huh? And uh, you teach the way of God truthfully and care for no man. For you do not think of the position men. Tell us, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? What a tough question. You know, I have sometimes <laughs> students come to my office and, you know, straight there at the door, Professor Stefanovich, boy, you are the best teacher here. I said, what do you need? Yes. <laughs> this is the situation. You know when people try to flatter. And how really to tempt Jesus, to test Jesus, mm. it's with taxes. Very dangerous things. Now, why would that have been an issue? We all pay taxes today. What was different back then? If he said, yes, you pay the taxes, what does that sound like? Actually, you know, we know that Palestine at that time was under Roman occupation mm. and the taxes were very important. So not to pay taxes, it meant rejection of the, of the Roman authority, which was very dangerous things. Actually, there was not uh, uh, one, two, three months or one year in the prison, it means death penalty. But those taxes were oppressive. I mean, we don't enjoy paying taxes today, but at least it's to our government. Imagine taxes to another government. So there is nationalism as well as this, this struggle that's going on here. How does he respond to their taxes? One fourth of the income went to the Romans. Yeah. Then, of course, um, Herod took his cut. He, he took his part. <laughs> And then we have tax collectors mm -hmm. who are plundering people. Then when you travel from one province to another, you know, um, uh, Matthew was a tax collector in Jericho there. It's, it's the gateway to, to, to Galilee, to J Jerusalem. They're waiting for you and mm -hmm. paying taxes. Actually, you pay taxes so much that we don't know how people survived at that time. So it was a very sensitive issue. Should we pay taxes? It means if Jesus said, yes, we have to pay taxes, what would mean? Oh, you see, you don't recognize God is our king. Yes. You approve what the Romans are doing. That was not God's plan to be. If Jesus said, no, you should not pay taxes, you know now what the consequences would be, would be. So what does he say? Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. It, it's an inspired and practical solution, isn't it? That's always the best answer. <laughs> Actually, our, our, our greatest of all teachers, this is what he made. Should I do something for people or for God? Jesus says, what you need to do for people, do for people, but what you need, to, what, what's due to God, do to God. Boy, what, what, what Don't what sacrifice you? one for the other. And there is another thing that I learned here is that Christians are always balanced people. Hmm. When we go so many times among the relig religious people, the people, everything is about God. When you see the way how they treat people, how they relate to the people, there is nothing of that uh, godliness, you know, that they practice in, the, in, in their lives. There are some people who really, everything is about humanity. Mm -hmm. Love for people, love for, 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 for people. But when they see the way how they relate to God, there is nothing that in God. Christian life is a balance. That's what actually the Bible is all about. We will see in our next uh, study is it's a vertical relationship, strong vertical relationship with God. At the same time, it's that right relationship, horizontal relationship with our fe fellow hum human beings. This is how, what the Christian life is all about. The Pharisees didn't succeed with their trap. The next day, the Sadducees come. Now the next one. All right. Verse 23 of Matthew 22, the same day Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection and they ask him a question saying, teacher, 
Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and hence raise up children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died and having no children left his wife to his brother. So to the second and the third down to the seventh. After them all, the, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, to which of the seven will she be a wife? For they all had her. Ronco, this is such a preposterous story. It's, it's outrageous, but they're trying to trap him. You know, I cannot, you know, but think about something from the Old Testament. I remember when I was a little boy and people are always talking, you know, um, when we resurrected the second coming of Christ, mm -hmm. when we find ourselves there before the throne of God, you know that question, who is the first person you would like to see there in King of God? You know, I would like to see my angel. I would like to see Jesus. As a young boy, I always had strange idea. I said, I would run all around because I would like to witness one scenery. I would like to see David, <laughs> Beersheba, Uriah Hittite, and Solomon. You know what I mean? Mm, mm. That was always, always uh, something is, actually I couldn't escape, you know, uh, thinking about this as you read, as you read this text. This is our human way of thinking yeah. is, of course they did it for malicious purposes. They tried to trap Jesus, to, let, to, to test him here. Let's remember that just like some people today, they're asking a question about something they don't even believe. They believe, yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, we already talk about that that there, there were four parties or Jewish sects in Palestine at the time of Jesus, two of which were the most prominent, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Pharisees, they really believed in everything what the Torah, what the law said. Mm -hmm. They believed in angels and they believed in life after that. They believed in the resurrection. They believed in the judgment day. Sadducees, Contrary to that, they deny any future life. They do not believe in the resurrection. But can you imagine? Now they're coming and tempting Jesus. They don't believe in the resurrection. They said, you said that there will be a resurrection. But now let, me, uh, let us ask you about this case. They, of course, invented the story. They said mm -hmm. she was uh, yeah. the wife of seven husbands. Now Jesus' response is very clear. So what was the Jesus response? Verse 29, but Jesus answered them, you are wrong because you neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. Can you stop wow, here for a while? Wow, what a statement. You know, as, as Christians, so many times we are struggling with many, many questions. Mm -hmm. And when I travel all around, I find so many neat and, and nice Christians, but they're coming to me. How is this possible? And, and so many times we find something that we do not understand and we are bothered with that. We are going asking people around and of course people can explain to us, telling us about something. But I learned something from these texts. Number, there are two things. Number one, I have to study the scripture. Yes. yes. Second one, if the Bible so many times it's silent uh, with, re with, with reference to some of my questions to give me the answer, I have to know the power of God. Mm. You know, the power of God. It means that so many times I think something is impossible. Something cannot happen. I have to trust God because God will do what is always the best for us. And it was also here in this case with reference to the question of the, of the Sadducees. So they don't know the scriptures, they don't know the power of God. And so Jesus begins to talk with them about what the resurrection will be like. Verse 30, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Ronco, does that mean that they're going to be, you know, when we get to heaven, we're just going to sit on a harp or have some boring existence, you know? Um, as a young person, that doesn't sound very attractive. And as an older person, it doesn't either. Yeah. Uh, we have to mention first one thing is Christians are talking so much about heaven. According to the Bible, our future is not in heaven. Our future is here on the earth that God will transform and to bring it into the original state that was before the appearance of sin. Yes, according to the Bible, we will go there to heaven for a trip right. for, for a certain period of time, but our future is is there. You see, the Sadducees, they're talking about heaven and Christians talking about the heaven, 
They, can recon they cannot reconcile our human body with heavenly realities, but our future is here on the earth, restored earth that God will do. And this text has been taken so many times by Christians. I have so many people asking about, about this. You know, I love my wife. I love my children. So one day when we get there to heaven, mm -hmm. I will see one person and I will ask, do we know each other? <laughs> oh, yes. We lived 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. You were my wife or you were my husband. Mm. What kind of God is that? Some kind of strange amnesia that we forget everything. See how people can take one biblical text out of the context. Jesus made this statement to the reference to the question of the Sadducees, not to tell us that the second coming of Christ, we will be divorced from our families, to tell us there is no marriage after the second coming. Doesn't make a difference. There are no weddings there in the, in the heavenly place. Let's, let's focus on the point that we'll be like angels. He's not just talking about their marital status. He's no. talking, what are angels? Uh, they're beings in the presence of God who are spending their lives praising Him and celebrating living in this wonderful world. So what it's is not about What is the mission, what is the intention of angels? Not to think about the marriage, yeah. It's about to give glory of God and to enjoy that beauty of the universe and heaven that God will give us to us. You see, the Sadducees were focusing on the non-essentials, but Jesus tried to direct their attention on something that is eternal and that is essential. Yes, we will be there with our families, but there is no wedding because those human relationships based on marriage will not occupy our attention in eternity after the second coming of Christ. This is the main point that actually Jesus wanted. And we to have to admit here. that we just don't know some things. It, yeah. That's hard for us to do. Sometimes it's hard for us to say, I don't know. The Bible hasn't told us. We need to be silent on some things when Scripture is. But we do have the indication from the resurrected Jesus that He knew His disciples and they knew Him. He was different, but He was the same person. So we do know that there will be relationships in heaven. Glenn, is it interesting is when Christians are reading uh, uh, this uh, conclusion that Jesus made, the conversation with the, with the, the Sadducees, um, so many times they are perplexed. Some even are upset. <laughs> yes. Thinking that Jesus thought that families will be separated one day, we will not be together. But when we read in verse 33, it says, when the crowds heard this, what Jesus said, they were astonished at his teaching. They understood clearly the message that Jesus, Jesus, Jesus made here. Because his last point is so powerful. He says, he is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. Glenn, I would like to address our viewers is to tell them, heaven will be a beautiful place. There is nothing in that heaven that will make us uncomfortable. It's the place that's supposed to be to make us happy.